We have a very spicy game update for Victoria 3 today, adding the techno state, the rise of all sorts of land reforms, and making nations more distinct. Let's jump in and take a look at what's on offer. Okay, so they start by setting a scene where they say that the ideas that are being expressed today, the changes that are coming, are around ideologies from the late 19th century, the early 20th century, and they're meant to represent some of the most contentious and important issues of the period. Starting off with what I think are probably the least radical of the changes, we have some changes to land reform. They start by saying that essentially, while many European nations, most in fact, had abolished formal serfdom, there was still a large amount of power concentrated with the landowners, the landlords, and many political movements developed to try and sort of cut that away from them. So under this new land reform law category, production methods around the rural economy have been decoupled, they've been separated from the economic law system, instead of sort of all being mishmashed and folded into one. The ownership production methods available for farms and plantations, for example, will be determined through the player's land reform laws, now not the economic system. Previously, the distinction between serfdom and non-serfdom was non-granular. Once serfdom was abolished, you could basically just ignore land reform entirely, only looking at it if you wanted to mess with workers' protections, which you probably didn't. Uh, with the new land reform law category, the issue of who owns the land has been separated from the rights of workers, so they're now two distinct things, allowing for increased choice with both categories and options for different political setups as well. And here now we get to see one of these laws in actions. Uh, they say that the new land reform law represents a variety of land ownership schema, all of which play an important role in affecting the political strength of groups, something else that's been changed quite a bit over the last few updates in Victoria 3. Those groups, how we see their strength and what they do or can do in future updates. Uh, while serfdom and tenant farmers greatly benefit the traditional landowning elites, the new homesteading law provides a base benefit to the political strength of our wonderful rural folk, uh, and it unlocks the new homesteading production method as well. So there's changes stretching beyond just the laws themselves. Uh, and that new method cuts the proportion of aristocrats and farms while increasing the amount of farmer jobs. So really pro-farmer obviously. Uh, in the picture that they provide, there's a wheat farm in Russia with serfdom active. And then we're also looking on the right-hand side uh, at a wheat farm in the USA with homesteading active. The USA's uh, homesteading law empowers the rural folk in the north, while southern plantations remained dominated by the landowners. But you can see how the difference between those two farms plays out, uh, particularly in the role of aristocrats, right, significantly reduced on the right-hand side, uh, whereas, of course, farmers significantly increased. So working as intended. Before we get on to the really spicy stuff, the atheism, the techno cyber states. Uh, first, there have just been uh, some more changes this time around commercialization or collectivization, which does actually lean into the rest of the changes. Uh, in this case, it's around agriculture, uh, aiming to represent more modern systems of industrialized agriculture, where commercialization, treating land as private property and farming as a business like no other, unlocking a new production method publicly traded. Uh, collectivized agriculture, on the other hand, organizes the land into plots, as you can imagine, worked by agricultural collectives. The collectives can either be owned by the workers themselves or directly by the state. And we'll talk more about mass state ownership down the line. Uh, and this unlocks both the workers' cooperative and government-run production methods. And as you can imagine, with these kind of more radical, more intense, more extreme changes that they're introducing to Victoria 3, it will create a little bit of turbulence, some contentious debate among the population, perhaps, even some fierce resistance. And they showcase a couple of different events where uh, essentially, in the, the very first one, to use it as an example, wealthy affiliates of the landowners in response to collectivized agriculture have ordered their stir surplus stock to be culled. Uh, and their bumper crops to be burned. So take that, huh? We're just going to burn it all. How do you like me now? 
Moving through and getting slightly more contentious as we go, the next topic to be covered is state atheism, a new law sitting under the church and state category. Previously, we had your state could have a state religion, there could be some freedom of conscience, or there could be separation of the church and state. Now we're receiving a fourth law on that list, much more in favour of the intelligentsia and moving against, of course, the traditional church. It's state atheism. If you're unfamiliar, state atheism in this case is the ultimate means to reduce the power of the devout within a nation. Not just separating the church from state, it will ban religion from public life and make all religious populations discriminated against. Nations with state atheism will gain a new atheist state religion. <laughs> it, it makes sense because it has to be, the, the populations have to be categorized. Uh, although there is a perhaps a slight subtle irony there, uh, to replace the previous one. And enactment will grant a small group of atheist pops in your nation. But don't forget, and the, the photo that they showed to demonstrate it, uh, pictured, while Mexico's policy has changed to state atheism, Catholics still make up a super majority of the nation. So it's only installed a very small amount. It has a long way to go to truly eradicate religion from public life, despite it being banned. And like with all of the contentious changes we're covering today, as you can imagine, not only will this significantly reduce the religious power, or the overall power, I should say, of religious institutions within the state, it will also create a lot of discriminated pops, potentially a lot of turmoil. It will be even more important to both focus on keeping your standard of living high and prioritizing national values to squash the remnants of religion in your country, they go on to say that state atheism will, perhaps as you expect, generally be backed by nihilists, communists and other similar ideologies. The process of enacting state atheism will ignite conflicts between secular and religious society, but apparently also open new opportunities for social experimentation as traditional institutions are marginalised. So potentially a lot more wide-sweeping change to come out of this simple law adjustment. <laughs> And now we're getting super spicy. A cybernetic state, a chief executive. We're talking about technocracy and single party states in Victoria 3. The final two laws to be added in the future patch 1.3 are the technocracy and single party state laws, both representing more modern distributions of power that were implemented or theorized during the tail end of Victoria 3's time period. So these are very much intended or, or, or theorized or set within the later end of Victoria 3, not your 1836 start perhaps, although there may be some ways to get around that. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, both of these laws uh, grant significant authority, as you can imagine, with a single party state granting the highest flat bonus to authority in the game. Go figure. Uh, and we can see it demonstrated on screen. Uh, the single party state gets 250 authority, plus an increased legitimacy based on votes, a uh, decreased government ideological penalty. On the other hand, technocracy, which we'll talk about shortly, gives uh, considerably less authority, but does still provide authority. In this case, it's more focused around perhaps the political strength of those technocrats, academics, engineers, officers, and the clout that role revolves around being the head of state and government. The new single party state law is intended as a late game replacement to something like autocracy or oligarchy. Uh, oligarchy? <laughs> That'll do. <laughs> it's been a long week uh, designed to fit into the era of mass politics and the party state. Once single party state is enacted, either the ruler's political party will become the sole party, or a new one will be formed around the ruler's interest group. Elections will be held every four years as normal, but as you would expect, the single legal party will always get 100% of that sweet vote. In terms of how the single party state will play out, as you can imagine, like the rest of these changes, going to ruffle a few feathers, that's for sure. Uh, those interest groups that aren't contained within the party are going to be pretty pissed about what's going on. However, on the other hand, of course, it will allow you to pass more authoritarian laws from command economy, collectivise agriculture, or more democratic, quote unquote, laws such as women's suffrage and elected bureaucrats become available. 
Now let's move on to technocracy, which is essentially a state ruled by the trained and educated. There is a desire, at least, to be ruled by technical experts. A technocratic state will tend to support more of the intelligentsia and the industrialists and provides benefits of political strength to the educated classes of population, those academics and officers. Technocracies will dispense with the inefficient and unenlightened notion of democracy altogether. See you later, democracy. Removing political parties, cancelling elections, and ruling in a similar fashion to autocracies, anarchies, and oligarchies. Here we get a little glimpse at a couple of uh, pretty funny governments. Uh, technocracy can be combined with every set of governance principles in the game, although such combinations may be quite unstable, meaning that both the platonic ideal of enlightened governance and the grand dreams of patriots can sort of be merged together. And so we end up with some interesting structures. For example, the cybernetic state on the right is a combination of the intelligentsia and our budding communist, <laughs> budding communist, <laughs> uh, cybernetic state. That is something, to be honest with you, I, I just didn't think we would ever see in Maine Victoria 3. So there you go. And did I say the final law last time? I was lying. There's actually one more. Uh, in a completely different shift, and just as with all the rest of these changes, quite a radical one, there's the ability to ban industry, a new economic system. Industry banned. It's the final law we'll be looking at today, and it's the precise opposite of technocracy. One of the most drastic changes in play style to Victoria 3. And when we look at how it's playing out in practice, it gives a big boost to the rural folks' political strength, as you can imagine. Tech spread is reduced, tech cost is increased because we're not exactly industrializing. You can subsidize all of your agriculture and plantations, uh, and aristocrats contribute to the investment pool. It will no longer be possible to build heavy industry, and all heavy industry will be dismantled. This one is, uh, like a lot of other things we've talked about today, fairly extreme. The law is designed to represent the most radical elements of opposition to industrialization of the Victorian era. Under the law, heavy industry, steel mills, motor industries and more will be destroyed and cannot be replaced. The law forbids all automation technologies and cut. The industry banned law represents, like a lot of other things we've discussed today, the most radical elements inside of Victoria 3. In this case, it's opposition to the very thing that defined the Victorian era, perhaps, industrialization. Under this law, all heavy industry, as we discussed, steel mills, chemical plants, etc., will be destroyed and it can't be replaced. The law also forbids automation technologies for the industries that remain, mandating the economy remain both small scale and labor intensive. Technology spread and research, as we discussed, sharply reduced, allowing for your nation to remain in a pristine pastoral state, unblemished by things like smog, labour-saving technology, or modern medicine. Who needs it? Of course, it's going to really frustrate a lot of your populations. Uh, they go on to say that with industry banned, you can combine it with the homesteading law we talked about earlier to provide a 75% a bonus to the clout of rural folk, creating the rural, idyllic realm with which power lies primarily within small holding settlers. Uh, they go on to say that, as you can see, we're putting significant effort into making internal politics and ideological variation more interesting and flavorful in 1.3, as well as creating additional laws for more exotic late game situations. Uh, and, and I completely agree. Well, one of the things that's often brought up about Victoria 3 is that idea that many nations are uh, too similar to one another, that the game uh, sometimes doesn't really even matter who you're playing, ends up playing out in a very similar way. And by adding these more extreme ends, these more perhaps sort of uh, slightly idealized, fantasized and less common uh, ideologies, particularly for the time period, should help to add that diversity that players have been wanting so much. And as one final note, revolutions now always adopt the most desired governance principles of their most powerful interest group. You won't be seeing any more radical 
or communist revolutions with monarchs at their heads. And that ends today's Victoria 3 update. Uh, very succinctly, that is all, and we will see you next week. Uh, no inkling on what's to come, but we are expecting more. And of course, if you're wondering or you've just tuned in for the first time, Victoria 3's 1.3 update hasn't yet been given a date, but it will include all of these law changes, as well as hopefully much more. Thank you very much for joining me today. I'll see you next time.